na liter plastics farmers walilima na intentions za kuharvest kitu wa kujua ground imeja makasets mdomo zimefungwa na cello tapes reason tuwezi bonga kuhusu pollution insane kila mali ni west ata cities na bado tuko busy tuna ban plastics ewa imetanjo kuwa vivid sis getting filled up plastic flow in liter tell me who's to blame when pollution getting deeper i think it's time to heal up this the way no more waste time to be the leader say what we got to heal up yeah. Hello everyone, my name is James Okibia. I'm a plastic waste campaigner and a photojournalist. I'm speaking to you live from Nakuru, Kenya. Nakuru is 250 kilometers northwest of Kenya capital, Nairobi. I will be chairing this session and I would like to welcome everyone to this COP26 Universities Network online webinar aimed plastic, climate and art of making change. Before we begin, I would like to mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available afterwards. I will share a brief introduction and then housekeeping. It's amazing to have an audience today from around the world joining us from across Europe, that is Italy, Sweden, Scotland, and Greece, to United Arab Emirates, across Africa, Nigeria, Tanzania, South Africa, and Kenya, and the Far East, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Australia. As you may know, world leaders and policymakers will be gathering in Glasgow in a couple of weeks to tackle the crisis of climate change. The University of Portsmouth is delivering this event on the first day of the city's three week long climate festival. This is a crucial time to gather and build momentum around mitigating the impact of plastics on climate change, which is a global challenge. We have a series of brilliant short presentations and film, films from environmentalists, creatives, and academics from here in Kenya, in Bangladesh, and the UK who have worked together on the recent STEP project. And we will hear about this from Cressida later. I would like to mention some housekeeping to our audience. Please feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourselves. There will be question and answer session in the last 40 minutes. So please add your questions and any comments in the Q&A box. We hope to have a lively discussion. For those who are on social media, please use the hashtag COP26Plastics for this event. So to begin with, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Steve Fletcher from the University of Portsmouth. He is a professor of ocean policy and economy and the lead for liberation plastics. Steve will be highlighting the connections between climate change and plastic waste. Steve, welcome and please go ahead. Thank you very much, James. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure to uh, be uh, speaking at this event. And it's great to see uh, so many people here from around the world. That's fabulous. So I think my presentation will uh, appear uh, any second. So as James said, uh, my very brief opening remarks really are focused on the connections between plastics and climate change. And right from the start, uh, I'd like to say that tackling plastic pollution is taking climate action. The connection between plastics and climate change is extremely clear. And that's really what I'm going to talk about for the next uh, three or four minutes. Uh, Next slide, please. So we know already that plastic production creates greenhouse gases through the exploitation of fossil fuels. We also know that plastic production is increasing and despite all the efforts of our leaders uh, and businesses that mismanaged plastic waste is also increasing. So the effects of plastic on climate are looking more serious as we move forward through time, not less. Next slide, please, Simon. <clears throat> we also need to recognize that 
plastics create an additional level of climate challenge through the effects plastic pollution has on natural systems. So we all know about plastic in the ocean. Increasingly, we're understanding about plastic in terrestrial ecosystems as well. But it's increasingly clear that that plastic pollution compromises the ability of those ecosystems to respond to the pressures they face from climate change. So plastic pollution makes it more difficult for natural systems to respond to the changes arising from plastic pollution. Next slide, please, Sandy. There is increasing evidence as well, of course, that plastic pollution has an effect on human health. That, in a way, is a, a connection to climate issues through bringing it home to us personally. So we're all breathing in microplastics most of the time. We are increasingly ingesting plastics in our food supplies. And where plastic is, uh, sorry, where waste plastic uh, is mismanaged quite often, there is an informal economy around dealing with that plastic waste. And, and estimates that were published last year suggest up to 1 million people per year die as a result of illness or uh, medical conditions that arise from dealing with that mismanaged plastic waste. So the, the human effect of plastic pollution and how we therefore tackle climate change is a, is a big and, and difficult question. Next slide, please. Later. There are also challenges, of course, uh, around the economy. And we know that pollution is a cost to the economy uh, and it's a drag on the economy that uh, is in some ways hard to, uh, to determine precisely. But in terms of specific examples, in, in some countries and, and cities, especially where plastic is clogging drains uh, and it's uh, just kind of everywhere, there's a real challenge then around flooding, perhaps, or there's a challenge around having a, a pride or sense of place in those locations. So it can affect the economy pretty uh, fundamentally in those ways. Uh, next slide, please. However, it's, it's not all uh, doom and gloom. And one of the uh, opportunities that plastics provides is because it is uh, ubiquitous, it's everywhere, and because people are familiar with it and have some control over its use in their lives, then it is also a potential pathway or route to helping uh, individuals, communities, whole cities and whole countries maybe transition to a more sustainable footing. And to go back to what I said at the beginning, tackling plastic pollution is taking climate action, then actually by placing tackling plastics at the centre of a strategy around sustainable transition, then actually we start to pick up the key issues of biodiversity loss, of climate action, of greater social equity, of better human health. And so as we've done in, in this project that we're here to talk about today, we've placed plastics at the centre of that transitional journey. Uh, final slide, please, Slater. So thank you very much. Uh, that's the, the close of my uh, opening comments. And uh, back to you, James. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. That was a wonderful presentation. And indeed, tackling plastic pollution is tackling climate action. Uh, the next uh, panel uh, will be by Mariel Virera. Mariel Virera is the Director of Global Strategy for Zero Waste uh, Europe. She'll be discussing reduction of plastic production, disposal in incinerators, and zero waste solutions. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for the opportunity of being here today. It's really inspiring to see the academic community being so committed to the research around plastic pollution. I'm Mariel Vilella. I'm the director of Global Strategy with Zero Waste Europe and Gaia. And for those that don't know us, we are a global alliance of more than 800 groups, NGOs and individuals over 90 countries. We have a vision that is a just zero waste world built on respect for ecological limits and community rights. 
where people are free from the burden of toxic pollution and resources are sustainably consumed, not burnt or dumped. We see waste and plastic pollution as a symptom of a larger profit-driven extractive economy. And we promote zero waste as a holistic solution and an economic shift toward justice and sustainability. In less than two weeks, the world's attention is gonna be on the COP26. This year, the COP is especially important as countries are expected to bring their updated national climate plans, the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, showing that their ambition is in line with the Paris Agreement. And precisely what was agreed in Paris is that we need urgent action to stop catastrophic climate change and a global temperature rise should be limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius, preferably. However, current plans do not put us anywhere near on track to achieve this. Current governments and corporate targets of net zero do not really mean zero emissions. We have scrutinized the NDCs, the National Climate Plans, presented up to date, and our research shows that up to a quarter of the NDCs submitted rely on misleading measures such as burning plastic waste in waste-to-energy incinerators and cement kilns, which contribute instead of mitigate the climate crisis. Our research that will be published next Monday reveals a staggering lack of ambition on the part of many countries for the waste sector. And this is a really huge missed opportunity. The IPCC itself has recognized that waste management is one of the three sectors with the greatest potential to reduce temperature rise in the next 10 to 20 years. And specifically looking at plastic, only 11 countries propose bans or restrictions on the use of plastic and none propose to restrict the production of plastic. So instead of measures to reverse the ever increasing trend of plastic production, what we're seeing is a rapid expansion of the plastic and the petrochemical industries. As we've heard already, plastic pollutes and emits greenhouse gases throughout its life cycle from extraction to disposal. And expanding this plastic production in association with loopholes, such as carbon offset trading schemes or unproven technologies like a carbon capture and storage, chemical recycling, geoengineering, will only serve to delay and distract from the action needed to implement real solutions. There is no room for increased plastic production in net zero we can get to 1.5 degrees or even to net zero without cutting plastic. What's more, plastic pollution disproportionately harms people of color and low income communities, fueling human rights violations across the globe. So this is not only a matter of greenhouse gas emissions, it's really a matter of climate justice. Gaia and Breakfit from Plastic will be participating at the COP26 and our delegation will bring three key demands to the delegates to UNFCCC. One, reduce plastic production, phase out single-use plastic and leave oil on the ground. Two, exclude waste to energy incineration from NDCs and any other climate plan. Three, reject plastic offsets and carbon removal strategies to reach net zero. Instead, we urge parties to include zero waste policies within national climate action plans and transform the dominant single-use plastic regime into a zero waste circular economy. We need to hold fossil fuel companies and corporate plastic polluters accountable for the impacts of worsening the climate crisis, especially on vulnerable communities. And we need to finance a just transitional model and a welfare system for recyclers, which addresses injustices, poverty and inequalities. The action we need is already being modeled at the local level around the world, including national level product bans, innovative reusable and refillable alternatives in the business sector and bans on the plastic waste trade. Now these actions need to be scaled up through national policy National zero waste plans offer a rapid, inexpensive strategy to reduce emissions, 
while increasing employment and economic activity. It's time for the UNF CCC parties to follow suit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mario. And uh, as you have stated, clearly we need to hold fossil fuel and petrochemicals companies accountable. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Sharia Hussein. Dr. Sharia Hussein is a senior technical advisor to Environment Social Development Organization, ESDO, in Indonesia. And he will be discussing environmental and human health impacts in face of uh, climate change on Bangladesh and Convention on Plastic Pollution. Welcome. Thank you, James. Uh, distinguished panelists, participants, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I would like to share my presentation. Just. Can you see my presentation? <clears throat> Yes, we can see it. Go ahead. Thank you. So I would like to focus on the plastic policies context of climate change. As today's discussion, the plastic policy on global context of climate change impacts. So I will try to focus on the explosion of the plastic lead to the global climate change. Need plastic treaty and next steps. <clears throat> so, this is an important scenario. My previous speaker had linked with this the environmental impacts across the life cycle of the plastics. I will try to visualize the situation in four steps. Extraction, production, use, and after use. So these are the four steps of the life cycle of the plastic. As many of you know that the process of extraction is a serious threat to the environment and human health. And it is not extraction of the natural resources, it is an extraction of the toxic pollutants. It is in create immense threat to the greenhouse gas emission and air pollution. Reduction process is also threaten our environment, human health, and greaterly the occupational health hazards. Again, we produce the different plastic items, plastic products. It's from house, it's from commodities, it's from vehicles and everyday life and which all are exposed to the human is exposed to the wildlife is exposed to our environment and thus impact to our climate after use we discarded the west the west we know that where the west goes the west goes to our sea our water bodies our landfill even in the ground level. And these waste create the continuous process of damaging of environmental impact and it's prevail decade and decade to destroy the mankind, to destroy our livings. So we have to think about, it is not only the greenhouse impact, it is the threat to our planet. So we have to see the life cycle and how to create the problem for our everyday lives. Impact of the climate change relate to the plastic pollution. As we know that there are many different impact we already have prevailed. It is not only the sea level rise, the third world countries are threatened by sea level rise. 
but it is not not only for the third world it is for the whole world it is for the whole planet it is the sea level rise changing what weather impact to all human beings impact to all nations around the world if we can see that there are many different kind of diseases we face every day every years we are suffering from the flood drought devastating climate calamities there is a unpredictable heat occurred in many countries even in the iceland so at the same time the tropical country face severe cold so this is a climate change this is a change prevailed right now so we are facing not only this change we are facing the huge impact to the human health the environmental health is totally threatened by pollution by the toxicity by the impact of the climate change covid-19 is a transmitted disease but if we can see the post situation it's also create huge impact because of the use of unexpected plastic materials so if we can see the annual emissions of the plastic we see the scenario current level of greenhouse gas emission from the plastic life cycle threatens the ability of the global community to keep global temperature raised below 1.5 degree celsius with the petrochemical and plastic industries planning to massive explosion in the production the problem is also track get in worse if the plastic production use grow as currently planned by 2030 this emission could reach 1.34 gigaton per year so we have to be warned this situation by 2050 the accumulation of this greenhouse gas emission from the plastic could reach over 56 gigaton which will be 10 to 13% of the entire remaining carbon budget nearly every piece of plastic being as a fossil fuel the greenhouse gas are emitted at each stage of the plastic life cycle fossil fuel extraction and transportation plastic refilling and manufacturers managing plastic waste and is going impact to our ocean water bodies and land each of those stages of the plastic life cycle to identify major source of greenhouse gas emission source of uncontrolled emission and likely to be lead to unwanted plastic climate impact worst in generation is a serious threat right now most of the developing country are pushing forward to the developed nations to the incineration is the solution so this is a one of the false solution that creating use have to the developing nation we are facing every day serious air pollution as you know bangladesh is right now the top three country of the world air pollution and dhaka city is the highest level of world air pollution in the world why 
The question is that we are not creating this problem, but we are suffering. The same situation in the many African countries like Kenya. We are not creating the problem. Who is creating the problem? Who is the culprit? So we have to think about the COP26 to address this situation. We have to address the situation that we should not take the burden of the air pollution by incineration. Plastic versus climate. It is marine life, wild species, environmental pollution, global warming, unknown impact of microplastic, the climate focus on ecosystem change, diversity threaten life cycle of the natural system we are facing every day, every time. The flat natural calamities is increasing. Destruction of the disease is coming up. So it is creating to push the nation, developing nation for huge cost of living. So environment, degradation, climate change, also the huge cost of living and sustainable development. This is a clear opinion, clear views from the impact of the West in Bangladesh that might to be, you can relate from your country and other nations. So these are the situation in Bangladesh. It is not the scene of scenario of Bangladesh, it's the scenario of the Asia. And I mentioned that the COVID-19 situation. This is a quick survey, quick study done by Environment and Social Development Organization that show the how plastic is increased, how plastic during and post COVID situation. And we are within this situation. It is not only the Bangladesh situation, it is the whole world situation. So as I mentioned earlier, this is of temperature, weather, population, and everything's by this region. You can see that the changes of the Bangladesh impact of the climate change, impact of the sea level rise. So what to do? We have to think, this is a high time to think about the plastic pollution and the global treaty. So in consideration, a new global legally binding convention on plastic pollution is needed. The explosion of the plastic have to be stopped, minimized global climate change. Idea widely supported by the group of experts established international response options. How we can proceed? So there is some steps we can think about. We can go through the four pillar of activities due to the time limit. I'm not going to go through the full presentation. So you will get this afterward. So finally, this is an important task for all of us to act closely to the COP26 and ask the member state to identify several areas where act activities are needed 
which can be broadly placed into the pillar of the action from the surroundings framework of convention of the plastic pollution. It is a crucial to the member states at UNIA 5.2 in March 22 in Nairobi. We should support, we should call intergovernmental negotiation committee to begin negotiation without delay to the eliminate and design the comprehensive convention on plastic pollution. This is the only viable effective means of tackle plastic pollution and save our ocean, save our land, save our livelihood. Let's work together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharia. And indeed, uh, the Global South is uh, suffering, I think, uh, the biggest from the effects of climate change than any other, than the Global North. While our contribution to climate change is only about 4%, and therefore, a lot needs to be done to mitigate the issues of climate change, you know, being affect, uh, affecting the Global South. Uh, next. Uh, I want to invite uh, uh, Dr. Cressida Boya. Cressida is a senior research uh, fellow at the University of Portsmouth. Uh, Cressida will be introducing us to the state project and the value of creative and participatory methods of climate action. Cressida, welcome. Thanks, James, and good day, everyone, and thanks very much for joining us. Um, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about the use of particip participatory arts-based methods for research and the sensitization of communities. Um, and I'd like to start with telling you about uh, the AIR Network. Now, the AIR Network was established four years ago with colleagues, um, researchers from Europe and researchers from Africa and community members from Nairobi. Um, and some of my colleagues who are part of the AIR Network are here today. So yeah, it's good to see you and welcome. And the long-term aim of the network is to create innovative and participatory solutions to the problem of air pollution, um, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I'm not going to tell you about the project and about Makuru. I'm going to uh, leave it to Dennis Waweru to tell you a bit more about this. My name is Dennis Waweru. I'm a resident of Makuru, Viwandan, since the day I was born. In Mokuru, we face a lot of challenges in terms of pollution because first, we are surrounded by polluting industry, dirty river, where all the drainages of the factory within the community end up to our river. We also have a dumping site within the community. So all the time, we have burning of garbages from all over the county, others from hospitals, chemical industry, big estates and many other places in mukuru pollution is the first challenge that affect people mostly so you found most of the children not going to school because of the effect they get during the process of burning of trashes bad smoke from companies dirty environment the other pollution is within our houses because most of the houses in Mokuru, they use charcoal or kerosene in terms of preparing meals and breakfast. So you end up inhaling the bad smell that comes out of your stove or lamp. And that smell from your stove kills you day by day slowly. So let's be our brother's keeper to raise awareness of the pollution in Mokuru. Thank you. So that's an example of um, a method called digital storytelling. 
Um, and I think that that example really nicely demonstrates the importance of um, hearing and listening to the community voice. It's also quite a good method to use as a starting point when you're working in a community to kind of get to know each other um, and start identifying the problems that you want to address. So we trialed a number of other creative approaches as part of the Air Network. We wanted to kind of ascertain what would work well really um, in this setting. So we did some participatory mapping. Here's one of the local artists, Skugi Waweru, uh, making a big canvas map of Makuru. And we took this map out into the community and invited community members to map air pollution hotspots. And this still is from a forum theatre piece that we ran and we use forum theatre to research lived experience and actually to trial um, alternative scenarios and outcomes to certain situations with the community where the audience members will watch a play and can step in and uh, direct the play so uh, it has a different outcome. So having identified that air pollution is a huge concern to the residents of Makuru, we secured further funding with Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and the Kenyan Institute of Medical Research to research lung health in five to 18 year old children in Makuru and compare their lung health with children from a neighbouring but more well to do suburb in Nairobi called Buruburu. And we're using creative methods um, to explore the lived experience of children's lung health from their perspective. Working with um, a colleague, Dr. Louis Netta, who is also participating in the panel later on. Um, the main method of data collection for the Tupamui study um, is spirometry. Now spirometry involves children blowing into a um, spirometer to assess their lung function. And it was really important to familiarize the community to demystify the research process um, and make sure that everyone knew exactly what was going to happen when they took part in the project in order to make sure that we could um, recruit a big enough cohort to uh, make the study powerful enough. Um, you, and you quiet. We and have been quite successful in doing that because we've now um, got 2000 children signed up for the study and we're well on our way to collecting all the data. Um, there's a bit more on the methods we used here. I'll just yeah. play this clip for um, a very short time. So um, you can find out more about the methods that we're using for Tupamui and watch those music, music videos in full if you go to our Tupamui YouTube channel um, and I'm sure Victoria will post a link to that in the chat box. So as well as plastic burning, another source of air pollution that was identified by community members was smell coming from open drainage channels, um, which is actually made worse by the fact that there's a lot of plastic waste blocking these drainage channels. And when floods occur, um, the plastic waste, you know, exacerbates the flooding. Um, and that's quite a nice example of how climate change and plastic waste, are, you know, intertwined, the effects are intertwined and exacerbate each other. So we secured some Global Challenges research funding um, to use our creative methods to start investigating sustainable transitions to end plastic pollution. And we continued our work um, with our community champions in Makuru, Nairobi, and we added in a second study site, which is Silet in Bangladesh. Um, Silet is the second city in Bangladesh, and is also heavily impacted by the presence of plastic waste, as um, Professor Sharia has just described. 
but then COVID happened. So we diverted some of our step resources and um, created a project called the ACT Project, Action Against COVID Transmission in Nairobi. This was like a really intense period of work over about three or four months where we developed some creative sensitization materials to sensitize the community on the importance of face masks, hand washing and social distancing in terms of reducing the transmission of COVID. And uh, Dr. Louis Netta worked with local artists, produced a comic about ACT and the messages that came out of the comic were actually interesting. They were around things like police brutality and um, prejudice to those who were thought to be infected with COVID. Um, and again, we made a song to um, promote the use of wearing face masks. Um, and please go to our YouTube channels to have a look at the song. So back to step, <laughs> as we are now back to step. Um, we've carried out a whole range of different community consultations, focus group sessions, questionnaires, qualitative questionnaires, participatory mapping exercises to kind of map the current practice around um, disposal of plastic waste, to map attitudes to plastic pollution in these environments, and to start identifying possible pathways to sustainable transitions to a better future to a reduction of plastic waste in these environments. And we've made, we've created a whole toolbox of sensitization materials of a great range. We've got murals, we've got songs, we've got film, we've got digital stories, we've got street theatre and we've got fashion shows going on in Bangladesh to highlight the issues around plastic pollution. Um, so just to sum up, um, Participatory research is carried out in the community, by the community, for the community. That's the really important thing. And it combines expert knowledge with local knowledge and social capital. Arts-based methods are particularly relevant for participatory research. We found that they really help to break down hierarchies, disrupt silos. They really engage and empower those who are participating in the projects. I have to say the academics as well, you know, as much as the community members. Um, and they often reveal hidden and unexpected truths. So I hope that you've had a flavour of how and why these methods are important and relevant when we're looking at climate change adaptations and resilience. You know, we really, really need to ensure that all stakeholders, all voices are heard and actually listened to um, where as we strive to cope with the changes that are happening to our planet and ensure that there is climate justice around the globe. So thank you. Yes, all voices should be heard, and uh, you've been doing quite an amazing job with the STEP project. Uh, there's, still, there's a lot of music, film, and all the amazing projects. Uh, good job, keep up. And uh, next, I want to invite uh, Nel Mumuniri, a musician. He's also the director of Mukuru Youth Initiative. He will introduce to us their film and also talk a little bit about the creative use of plastic waste. Welcome, also Nelmo Muniri. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening for, uh, to everyone. Um, so my name is Nelson Muniri, but I'm better known as Nelmo because uh, that is the name that is very popular in the community because I'm an artist. And uh, basically we've been working uh, um, uh, with uh, the University of Portsmouth uh, a lot, and uh, we, I was part of the ACT project. Uh, we are doing a lot of awareness around COVID-19, uh, and also uh, been taking lead uh, in the state project. Um, um, basically, what we, have, we were focusing through the state project was uh, the use of art. Uh, we were very key in using art to be able to not only do the research, but also engage uh, the community and be able to share uh, information and make awareness in the community around plastic pollution. And of course, it was very interesting. And um, 
uh, we even go to interact with different young people doing different things. Um, and right now, I want uh, to share a film that we produced, uh, just highlighting some of the interventions that young people uh, have been doing in the community. Uh, and this is just like a sample, because there's so many other young people, millions and millions around the world, who uh, are not part of the uh, pollutants, but also they're trying to provide uh, solutions. So uh, it's also my hope that uh, during the COP26, we'll be able to see uh, also the people concerned to be able to take action on their own front, because young people are already very active and very proactive in whatever we are doing, in making awareness, uh, different interventions, trying to reduce, reuse, and recycle. So right now, I present the uh, uh, the STEP project uh, documentary. My name is Nelson Munyiri, better known as Nel Munyusong. I'm a recording performing artist and also the executive director of Mukuru's Initiative. So the STEP project uh, has been a great project, a project that uh, we've been focusing on plastic pollution and basically getting to work with different community champions, different uh, young people doing different things in the community, those who are in, 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 the, in recycling, those who use trash as also their source of income. Also getting to highlight some of the issues in the community. For example, we have been having champions talking about their daily interaction with plastics. Hi, my name is Weche. I'm from Mokuru. My name is Mboya Kevin. My name is Winfred Wadia and I'm a community champion. I came across this dump site. As you can see behind me, there are cows feeding on the litter there. Yeah, they may feed on the plastic bags and the plastics. Uh, over the past one week, I've been going around noting down both permanent and temporarily dumping sites and I've noticed that most of us are just careless, we are just throwing plastic waste everywhere. I think uh, those Ill illegal dumping sites we have within our area uh, are the ones that makes our environment to be polluted. We really urge the residents and our PSC whenever to take the necessary precautions to optimize plastic paper spray and also how they are able to reduce, reuse and recycle plastics. So for example, the young people who are using the plastic cans to plant flowers, plant some plants within their homestead. And also uh, there are those young people who uh, recycle plastic. So there is even a, a recycling plant, Mukuru um, Integrated Waste Management. Uh, who recycle plastics and they're able to add value to them. Reuse to see too, but when you recycle, the better too. Reduce, reuse, recycle. When you recycle, the better too. Reduce, reuse. Uh,
kando ndoto yangu na nikapata mkuru kwa mwezi wa 60 na mkuru nikabidi tu decide best management so if i to to focus na mambo ya 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 project ya plastic one nilikuwa ni angalia nilikuwa na mambo za plastic pollution sana na zimekuwa so rampant in in form of settlement no but um, uh, one hapa watu tume plastic haziko hazi recycled hapa kwa kwa ground na two pia kuna zile product zile zimetumika na kama plastic zile zimeharibika zime nini na nini kuna pasta nyingine zinakuwa wasted zinatoka kwa kwa drainage trenches zile zinatoka kwa rivers zile zinatoka tu kwa just anywhere na unapata pia ziko na effect zile zile ziko kwa soil na pia kwa kwa rivers zile zile ziko around so uh, kwa recycling plant kitu sisi tunafanya uh, tuna work na na different individual na individuals na groups uh, kwa project yenye kuna ya recycling na zile vitu vya tunafanya tunafanya mambo za waste stockpiling na pia mambo za waste management recycling hiyo kwa nayo ina deal na only plastic but kwa pia tunaangalia pia contribution tunafanya kwa mambo za environment kishinda nguru we minda swim wa pili kwa pata samaki matuari swachaji bondesha kwa tofaya leo tumekuwa na clean up the tributary of Congo River as you can see when iko na plastics mingi waste mingi na waste yote iko mixed up so tumekuwa ni tumekuwa tukifanya at least clean up na pia ki separate uh, valuable goods like plastics zile zinaweza kuwa recycled na net bags na those useful products zile zinaweza kuwa separate reduce reuse recycle working with the university of uh, portsmouth basically um, we've been using the, we've been using art as uh, the main form of sharing the information and educating the community on plastic pollution we did a song uh, it's on youtube it's called oh, ni wajibu ni wajibu wangu tuanze leo ni wajibu wako tuijali kesho we intoxicated we intoxicated we can reduce the plastic use we can reuse to see to the when you recycle the better to reduce reuse recycle when you recycle the better to basically talking about uh, issues to do with plastic the pollution that plastic is causing in the community and also trying to provide some of the solution that we can do to be able to uh, reduce plastic pollution also the art just behind me is one of the art uh, so what we did is be able to, to create different scenarios showing uh, a community without proper waste management and a community with proper waste management and uh, that is highlighted through the pictures behind me so that's what we've been using we've been highlighting through the, the, the project and So yeah uh, so basically uh, that has been some of the work uh, we were not able to compile everything into it we did mapping of different dump sites in the community uh, we were able to uh, even have conversation and um, even in the process of trying to install dustbins that I, people are able to segregate waste and uh, of course they were uh, very interesting we even had a partnership with uh, other organization to start conversation around the Nairobi River regeneration so um, basically has been a great uh, a, a great uh, way of even partnering with other organizations that are already carrying out different interventions including the flip, flip floppy uh, there is uh, the um, NAM festival uh, all the way to Dandora Hip Hop City with the Ataka Bank uh, we have the Green Junior um,
uh, here in the community, Alliance Francais. So uh, basically, we're able to interact a lot and uh, share ideas and different ways of even taking more action in the community. And I believe these are things that we're able to carry forward and be able to continue talking. So, of course, the song is on YouTube. I'm seeing uh, so many people asking where we can get the song. It's called Wajibu. You just write new Wajibu, and then you can, you can just write Nelmo. Uh, then you, you'll get the, the, the song. Um, yeah, and I think that's all the time I had for today. But uh, you can uh, check out the music, of course. Thank you so much, Nell Mother. I was beautiful song, and also the documentary is also very, uh, you know, it's engaging, telling us the stories and what the communities can do. I have seen people very, you know, positive about the environment, trying to change it. So it's their wajibu. Wow. You know, wajibu means it's their responsibility. You know, they're taking it as their responsibility to keep their environment clean. And uh, that was very good. And I think something I want to mention is that we speakers who are the backbone to, to recycling, you know, need to have their plight taken care of. You know, we have, we don't see their value. And I, th I think it, it's, it's time we see their value because these are environmentalists, number one, they are removing plastics from the environment and taking it to recycling. You know, and without them, the whole issue of what we talk about circular economy, you know, it's going to be a buzzword, but because of them, you know, circular economy is gaining momentum and it's meaning something. So thank you so much, uh, Nelmo, for that. And of course, for reduce, reuse, refuse, you know, that they won't go away. And for now, we're gonna take a break, a few minutes of a break, uh, some, can take a bottle of water not in plastic, of course, as uh, then we come back later. I want to invite Esra Karim, who is the founder and director of the Imal Foundation. Esra will be talking about uh, adaptation and resilience, using recycled plastic drums to make floating houses in flood zones in Bangladesh. Looks something interesting. Welcome. So, Here's a glance of our work we have been doing. So we are working with more than 30 plus projects and worked more with uh, 360,000 beneficiaries, mostly women and children in different sectors. We will basically work with four sectors, education, health, empowerment, and emergency crisis. So this is me. I have started Amal Foundation six years back by myself. It's a small, humble organization we started with volunteers. Right now, we have a team of 25 full-time employees. Besides, we have part-time employees and 5,000 volunteers all over the country. These are our... Uh, panel of advisors, as you can see, some of our, my mentors, direct mentors, my teachers, peers, and supporters. And these are the organizations who have worked so far. And as I spoke before, like we focus on four things, education, emergency crisis, empowerment, and health. And these are the SDGs we covered and we're working with. Now coming uh, coming back to to the uh, areas uh, Professor Mostafizur has been referring to, so these areas are river islands, and this is not something we picture in USA or UK like all those amazing river islands where people after retiring go, uh, goes there and lives. These river islands are very much prone to uh, natural disaster, and they are exposed to the climate change at its best. By this, what I meant actually, we know every year the water level is rising. And these uh, areas actually get underwater every year from four to six, for mostly four to six months. And I, while working there, I've been working for the last six years, I have experienced that people over there has been taking these things for granted, like they know uh, July is coming, so it's gonna, it's gonna be raining a lot, then suddenly the, they will know that water is coming down into their houses, it's gonna make all of their uh, furniture and everything uh, will be underwater, and then they'll start living on the roofs of, of their houses. 
and uh, this is something very heartbreaking very devastating because to some extent we are also responsible for their situation as you can see, uh, these, these are the um, areas and people are really, really living there below poverty. Um, they live from hand to mouth, mostly they are farmers or fishermen. And uh, Amal Foundation has started working in those areas because those areas are so uh, remote and secluded that you, you won't find any school, any medical support, any kind of uh, uh, sanitary, sanitary support in those areas. So I've started with our school. Then we, we also work with the farmers. We train them closely in those areas as well. And we have another notable project we are working in the river island areas is Women's Skill Center. Here, most of the beneficiaries are, are the victim of child marriage or dowry, and they have been disowned by the family. So we brought all these women together. We're teaching them tailoring, vocational training. They're making handicrafts, and they're selling. Uh, then we are selling it all over the world towards our well-wishers. So this is a social business model. And under this brand, uh, model, there is a brand called Azwa. Azwa is a sister concern of Amal. And uh, in 2020, Azwa and myself both got enlisted in the Forbes magazine, Forbes 30 and the 30 Asia for this particular project. And this is our uh, sanitary project, as you can see. So now, uh, thank you so much for listening patiently about our introduction. I'll be moving towards our uh, concept. And the concept is very simple, very clear. Um, I have been working with uh, some of my peers and colleagues from the Harvard Architecture School. So them and there are some uh, smart architectures over here. We all uh, came together and we're discussing that every year, when we uh, go to these uh, uh, river islands, we see people are going through such devastating situations like they, they will lose their cattle, they will lose their houses and they have to start their living by rebuilding again. And isn't there anything we can do? Like I was one day asking a farmer over there that uh, what, what do you mean? What would, will make you so happy? Like what is the biggest dream of your life? And he said that if I had enough money to make my house bit uh, uh, like raise my, the land in my house. So every year it won't go underwater and I, I'll be the happiest man. Then I asked him like how much it will take? And he was saying it's, it, it's going to take around uh, 70,000 uh, Bangladeshi taka, which is around $200, uh, 200 plus dollar. And I was just thinking that this is this man's dream, like the dream of uh, only just 200 taka, which can change their life forever. So putting all these thoughts and ideas, we uh, sat together and we we're thinking that if we could develop a concept, well, in these areas, in the river uh, flood prone areas, um, we can build some, some sort of shelters or construction, const like infrastructures that won't get underwater, that would float. And there's the concept, like the way um, the leaves actually stays on the surface of water, it doesn't get drawn. Keeping that in mind, we designed it um, with the, all the architectural uh, insights and support. And as you can see, th this is the model and the whole thing will be floating. And the most interesting part is um, it will be floated under drums, drums which are made of plastic. Like we, we see all these blue drums, uh, mostly in Bangladesh, we use for um, keeping our trashes or uh, it could be used in the industrial areas. And Sometimes it gets totally uh, dumped by the people once uh, they have uh, made their uses. So we want to bring all these sort of drums and the, the plan of this project is put the drums uh, underneath the infrastructure and making sure that it floats when the flood is coming. And we have already started a pilot. Uh, we are working on it. Uh, this this uh, year we'll be working on the pilot and we'll, uh, with a small infrastructure, maybe a small house, and we'll be seeing how does it goes and what kind of a difference it, it, it makes in their lives.
And this is the bigger project plan that we want to make a whole one-stop uh, center, which will have emergency rescue service, medical assistance, uh, assistance for women, there will be educational support, control office, and everything. That's how we planned. And this is how it looks like. Another thing is we'll be using local infrastructures, uh, mostly bamboos and uh, everything we can um, uh, get resource from our local uh, villages because these uh, river islands are very, very remote and getting things transported those areas are very costly as well as uh, time consuming. So we'll be using things which has been naturally grown in those areas like bamboos, um, like jute, jute materials, and things like that. So keep uh, putting all this to, uh, together, we'll be making this infrastructure. And as Bangladesh is a river Rhine country, we have so many rivers and this river has got river islands and these river islands are not small. More than 20, 30,000 people are living in those areas. And every year they get exposed to flood, mm -hmm. uh, they lose their everything. And from there, they rebuild their life. They're facing, they're actually suffering due to the cli climate crisis. And we are the one, we should come forward and support them and make sure that they live comfortably, they live happily. So uh, not a fur further ado, that, that's it from my presentation. I'm not uh, gonna bring all this technical stuff over here, but this is what we are doing. If you, any of you are interested to know more about this project, please do reach out to me. I'll be putting my email address on the chat box. And we are hoping to start the pilot uh, by this uh, August. We'll definitely love to share the updates of the project as well. Thank you so much for, for listening to me, hearing me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Now I want to invite Dipesh Bari. Dipesh uh, works with the Free Floppy. And uh, he will tell us about the Free Floppy exhibition and uh, his work with the NAM Festival and everything to do with the, the amazing Free Floppy expedition that I was part of. Karibu sana, Dipesh. Asante James, um, can you hear me? We can hear you nicely, continue. Oh good, um, uh, I'm actually standing in for Dave Ojay, who's the, the founder of the NAM Festival, um, who is going to give the introduction, but he's unwell. So um, you'll forgive me, but I'm going to read from my notes. Um, and thank you all for, for, this, for this opportunity as well to be a part of this. Um, just a little bit of background on the Flip Floppy Project. We're a circular economy movement based in Kenya, whose vision is a world without single-use plastic. We showcase alternate use of waste plastics and the viability of a circular economy through education programs, our innovation hubs, and our advocacy programs. We built the world's first recycled plastic sailing dhow, a nine-meter traditional vessel weighing over seven tons and clad in over 30,000 flip flops picked from the beaches of Kenya. We did this to show that single use plastic simply does not make sense. If you can build a nine meter boat and sail it hundreds of, hundreds of kilometers across lakes and oceans, essentially made out of old toothbrushes, um, it definitely shows you just how valuable a, a material plastic is. But it's more than that to us. The boat is a traditional dhow, similar to the ones that have been crossing oceans for the past 2000 years. Um, in Bangladesh, you, would have, you have your own as well, very similar to what we have in East Africa. We've been crossing the oceans for the past 2000 years, connecting cultures and bringing people together. It's a symbol of our heritage, and that is fundamental. But it also defines our positive and colorful approach to engage and inspire as a work of art and has defined our approach for the past five years. We need a paradigm shift. We need to redefine what the term waste is. But new. Just like circular economy principles, the fundamental beliefs are part and parcel of many indigenous systems across the world. The concept of waste is a fairly new part of culture and industrial evolution. To address plastic pollution, we need to turn to other cultures and learn from them. I believe art is one approach to rewriting meaning and, re and recreating value. 
um, changing mindsets so that we can return to a circular society. Art touches the fabric of every one of us, contributes to that paradigm shift that we desperately need. So our little boat hopefully is more than just functional. And hopefully the, the collage of videos that um, the University of Portsmouth have just stitched together um, will be an example of the art of making change. Thank you. My name is Ben Morrison and I'm part of a team that is building a 55 foot Swahili Dao, which is a traditional uh, sailing boat here in Lamu on the Kenya coast and we are going to build it over the course of a year. We're going to cover it in recycled flip-flops which is a major component of the plastic waste that we find here in Kenya. In a year's time we're going to sail it to Cape Town in South Africa so it's a journey of 5,000 kilometers. The journey taking this fun colorful flip-flop cover dhow all the way down to Cape Town is about getting the attention of the world on this issue. Look at this, this is, this is plastic we've collected off a beach which has got a real valuable use as a second life. Baba, can't we all collect enough plastic to build a really big boat? Ali also had an idea. And we can start a club at school, Baba, to teach people how to reduce plastic pollution. Yes, excellent their father said excitedly. Soon, everyone was involved in building a dhow from plastic sandals, plastic bags, plastic bottles, plastic everything. Once finished, it was very colorful too. What shall we call it, Baba? The children asked. Flip floppy, their father suggested. Everyone agreed. Flip Floppy! Flip Floppy sailed to different places in different countries, collecting plastic on its way. All who saw it, all who heard about it, were amazed. Children became the teachers. Everyone learned to use less plastic Everyone learned to turn their plastic into something else. Aisha, Ali, and Flip Floppy, the multicolored dow boat, had made the world a better place. NAM Festival is a creative, social, and environmental activism organization that uses art as an advocacy tool to push for a mindset shift and action. Human being is destroying the world. And people are not realizing this. We, we don't love our world. But by just focusing on the short-term vision, people are just looking at the money today and they don't think of what is coming next. Everyone today is affected by plastic, but we have the solution. One thing that we completely underestimated was just how powerful an engagement tool it's been. Everywhere we've gone, it's been like iron filings to a magnet. People have been magnetized to this optimistic, joyful project. We've actually had tangible results from our expedition. A hotel chain has banned single-use straws and bottles. We've seen the closing of Mombasa's dump site. We brought together the background conditions for change to happen, and it's done so thanks to taking it on a journey and expedition. The end goal is to live in a world without single-use plastic. Right now we're imagining it and we're imagining what it can be like. The boat is very much just a vessel to reach that target. What we've done so far is give plastic a second life. What we need to do is end single-use plastic.
I am optimistic that we might see the right changes in our lifetime. Everyone loves a positive story. Everyone loves something hopeful. You know, everyone likes to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that's what Flip Floppy is. She's that light at the end of the tunnel. My name is Ali Abdallah Skanda, one of a co-founder of a Flip Flop project, the world's first recycled plastic DAO, which entirely made up of a waste collection from our ocean shores and beaches. We built this DAO for around two years, where we use almost 10 tons of hard plastic and attach with 30,000 flip flops. As we approach COP26, I'm very much pleased to participate my small island of Lamu, which is uh, northeastern of Kenya, as we have been affected so highly with the uh, pollution of plastic. As we are experiencing too much of weather changing, low rainfall, a lot of plastic in our nets than fish, we are now collecting together globally, like Portmouth University, as together we can do a solution. Nothing is impossible. Is what our father and our good people are telling. Kila kitu no kana. It's just a case of logic for me. We can do it. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Deepesh. Indeed, single use plastics does not make sense. And plastic that should be recycled, should be recycled to make you know, products like uh, the Flip Floppy, which is uh, you know, bringing a lot of change, which is creating awareness about plastic pollution in the world. I think I want to uh, introduce Sarah West to introduce herself. Hi, thanks everybody. Really exciting to be here and to hear about all the fantastic work that's been going on from all of the projects. Um, so I'm from the Stockholm Environment Institute at the University of York and I was involved in the Air Network and the Tupamue project and the Action on Covid transmission project that um, Cressida talked about earlier. So yes, yeah, so my expertise is in citizen science and other participatory approaches, so how we can bring diverse voices into our research um, around all sorts of issues, including um, air pollution, plastics, climate change, all sorts of things. So yeah, happy to answer questions that are related to community participation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. I think you will have a question to answer in a few. I want to uh, hear from uh, Ruiz, uh, Louis Neto. You want to introduce yourself? Okay. Hello, I'm Louis Neto. I work with um, Dr. Cresta Bauer, and we've worked. Uh, I've worked on the ACT project. I did the comic, and um, we did some mural work and so on and so forth. But um, yes, also very interested in participatory methods and also seeing the kind of power and impact, self empowerment, and kind of self determination that can come from um, engaging people through art by uh, either making it or exposing them to to art, but also really ultimately learning um, from effective practices on the ground and expanding them. But that's essentially what what I do. Thank you so much. I think uh, next we are going to have some questions. I see some questions in the Q&A and uh, let me go through them and then we'll choose who to answer them. There's a question from Abby Lawson. And uh, Abby is asking, I recently discovered that COP26 is not to be representing the waste management industry appropriately. appropriately. How are we supposed to tackle plastic waste and the way it is disposed when the industry itself will not be represented at COP26? Uh, uh, Fletcher, are you going to take that? Should we post that question to Marielle? Yes, come. Say that again. Yeah, Marielle, please take it. Um, sure. So basically, the COP26 is primarily the UN negotiations where the main parties that are negotiating are the delegation of the governments, which are the parties to the convention. This is the conference of the parties to the UNFCCC. So 
these are the main actors that are part of the uh, the core of these negotiations is the is the governments and they are responsible for producing the legally binding agreements that are going to take us um, to meet the commitments for the Paris Agreement. Around that, there is a large um, amount of uh, stakeholders, different constituencies, um, which include scientists, young people, indigenous, uh, gender constituencies, etc. These are all observer delegates, and these are all represented as well in the negotiations. The industry is as well represented as they are able as well to be observer to these uh, negotiations, and they will be there very well present, and, and they will be able to organize side events, and they will be able to lobby the negotiations and influence, etc. So, if anything, what we find at the COP26 is this is a space that's been very much dominated by rich countries and the industry. So this is why over the course of the years, we have seen progress and we have signs of hope, but really not as much as we really need to stop catastrophic climate change. So the industry is very well represented. If anything from civil society, there's been a big outcry of how much the COP is captured by corporations. So really, the, if you see the side events of the COP, you will see that um, there's different organizations that will be as well representing the interests of the fossil fuel industries, the interest of the petrochemical industries, and also from the consumer good industry. So it is well represented. They are not in the negotiation table because they don't have to be, because the negotiation table is for the governments, but definitely along with civil society, along with other constituencies um, of society, they will be there very much present. Thank you. I hope uh, Abby, Abby's question is well answered. I think uh, the next question goes to Sarah. It's about uh, communities and uh, uh, somebody by the name of Dongo Kelvin from Green Slam Innovation Hub is asking, how are the local communities going to get uh, the full information on set agreements and policies from the COP26 summit? This is because the locals or the local communities are the ones to implement the NDC. Uh, would you, do you think you're going to take that question, Sarah? I can have a start at it, but then I think we've got other experts on the panel who would be better placed. But just to start off, um, I slightly take, um, disagree with your, your comment that local are going to be the ones to implement it, because actually I think there are a lot of local action that can be important. I mean, we saw for the flippy floppy, amazing inspiration video, local people collecting plastics, making it into that beautiful boat. But actually governments have a real responsibility here. Industry have a real responsibility here to make changes. And those are the ones who are going to be helping drive the change as well as the bottom up changes. I think there's been a real push and particularly in the plastics and particularly in the Western um, world of this kind of like individual action is going to make a difference and it will but we need systemic change too um but yeah specifically about how locals are going to kind of understand about what happens at cop i don't know if there are others who would like to answer that yeah can i just make a few comments on that sarah thank you i mean firstly i'd like to say that you know participatory methods and community-based research must not be about passing the buck for you know, actions for climate change to be, you know, we're reading a lot about, you know, we must listen to indig indigenous voices and we must, you know, th this mustn't be an excuse for going, oh, it's not industry or Global North government responsibilities anymore. And I think there is a little bit of a danger of that happening. Um, in terms of transmitting information from COP26 back to communities. I think that would be really interesting <laughs> to run some sessions about how communities would like to have some of the COP26 outcomes transmitted back to them. Um, we're in Portsmouth, we're actually holding a two-week Portsmouth Climate Festival, that a three-week Portsmouth Climate Festival that encompasses the two weeks of COP26. And we have a couple of events at the beginning of the festival, we're talking about climate risk for Portsmouth, 
And at the end of the festival, we're going to talk about outcomes of COP26 and how they might apply to Portsmouth. So it's that kind of distilling, localising, but not letting the key players get away with not taking any action themselves. So the next question for the uh, panel is, uh, what is the direct link between plastic pollution and ch uh, climate change? Is there anyone who would like to take that question? Uh, yes, I think uh, in my presentation, there is a clear link with the climate change uh, of the plastic pollution. And if we can, if we can see the life cycle of the plastic pollution or plastic and that uh, step by steps, the four steps of the life cycle of the plastic, the extraction, production, uses and discard. So all the process is linked, very much linked with the climate change impact like uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission. Uh, this is uh, also uh, the, if you can see this sea pollution, this is uh, ocean pollution is linked with the climate change. The land pollution, air pollution is definitely direct link with the cli climate change. Yeah, can I, can I add a little bit more to that about adaptation and resilience and the way that the presence of plastic waste in the in different environments really does reduce the ability of the environment or the economy or the community or the individual or the animal to deal with the impact of climate change. So for instance, you know, you've got sea level rises due to climate change massively impacting Bangladesh, as we've just heard. The presence of plastic waste blocking the flooding channels, blocking the canals, blocking the drainage channels. It's really going to make the impacts of those floods a lot more serious and a lot more severe. Similarly, you know, something like um, fishing, the fishing industry, for instance, you know, is the biodiversity in the seas is impacted by climate change. Add into that the fact that we've got so much plastic in the sea, we expect plastics to outnumber fish. Um, and, you know, we've got all, all these kind of intertwined perfect storms. And we don't really know what the combined and exponential effects of all these things are. Um, but yeah, pollution, biodiversity, climate change, all inextricably interwoven with each other. Saida, do you have do we have any more questions? I just read it in the all questions. Hi James, there's another question in the QA box. Oh yeah, I see it. Uh, we have a question from uh, Victoria. She's asking: During the whole plastic uh, life cycle, can can flip floppy and other structures and artworks made from recycled plastic be reused or recycled, and at the end of their life into new artworks and items? I think that should uh, Deepesh uh, will take that since it's mentioned in the flip floppy? Yeah, sure. Um, I was actually just typing out the answer. Um, in terms of the end of life, essentially it's recycled plastic, mostly HDPEs, LDPEs. So we, we have tried with certain parts of the boat, we can just grind it up and, and turn it back into something else. Um, we are looking more into improving the sort of um, parts of the boat now, so to get, uh, to get longer duration. They don't, they last forever, essentially. Um, in answer to your other question about concerns of microplastics leaking into the ocean, it has been asked of us quite a few times. Um, when we were putting the boat together, we did consult with various specialists on this. And I remember his answer very carefully, uh, um, just to sort of paraphrase the answer I got. Um, he said something to the effect of, I suspect that more microplastics would be making their, uh, their way from your dustbin to the ocean than coming off your boat in a lifetime. Um, so 
he was um, this was a this was a microplastic specialist from a university several years ago. So that was the response, and we we're feeling fairly confident about that as well. Again, um, our next stages right now are sort of looking at improving, improving the improving the prototype, which is what the flip floppy is, um, establishing a heritage boat building school in Lamu, where the flip floppy originated. Um, hopefully, in partnership with Portsmouth and other and other partners, and then um, working as an innovation hub to continuously improve, engage and sort of come up with other products similar to the boat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deepesh. And I think you could mention a little bit about uh, your like, Victoria expedition and microplastic research that uh, you are doing. Yeah, Tim. so we've also used the expeditions to, to, to undertake, um, to partner with um, research organizations or universities and to take on studies um, to do with sort of um, presence of microplastics in, in, in these bodies of water. Um, we, we conducted a microplastic study um, on our first expedition to Zanzibar. The data is still being completed. And then more recently this year, we did the first um, surface to deep water analysis of the presence of microplastics in Lake Victoria. There hasn't been anything of that detail yet, but. Um, studies were done last year, the first of their kind were done last year that showed that about one in five fish had significant presence of microplastics um, in, the, in their bellies, um, which was fairly alarming because nobody had actually looked at this in a body, a freshwater body of water as big as Lake Victoria, which is um, the second largest lake in the world with over 40 million people dependent on it. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, somebody, somebody mentioned my name or somebody wants to, to add something. Yes. Yep. Uh, James, I, I just wanted to add about the microplastic because uh, this is a serious issue right now. And uh, we had uh, conducted a study in 2016 uh, in Bangladesh and four region. And that is, uh, we, we found the presence of the micro bits and microplastic in the fish. And so, it is not from the sea, it is a freshwater fish. So that is uh, indicating that the leakage of the microplastic and micro bits from the source of products, it is not just from the west. So, and we found that the, some products and particularly the face wash and um, shower gel, toothpaste, are contained high level of microplastic and micro bits. So the products already have the content of the microplastic and micro bits that's uh, released to the uh, sewage and ultimately goes to the water bodies. So it is not just for uh, leakage from the West, it is a, from the product. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, anybody wants to add uh, one more thing about microplastic? All right, beautiful. I think there was a question by about microplastic. Let me get it a moment. Uh, it was sent to, to Sarah. I'm trying to get it. Is it? Uh, James, the, uh, the question is, um, what solutions are available to curb or stop plastic microplastics in freshwater lakes? Yeah, definitely not my bag. And uh, who could be? Okay, I can, I can just uh, respond because uh, of the solution. It is very difficult. It is not one step solution. It is a multiple solution to be addressed. The first, we are focusing on the microplastic and microbits in the product, so that product should be stopped. So <clears throat> this, this is need to be the regulation. This is need to be, and as many of you know that the, there are uh, many countries in Europe has, even in Bangladesh, has the regulation to stop using microbits and microplastic in cosmetics. So this, regulation has helped to prevent 
the microplastic and microwaves used in the products. So other way that this is need to be the tracking mechanism. And all the same time, this is, this is kind of difficult situation. If we are going to uh, address the recycling of the plastic, the recycling of the plastic is a major source of microplastic. So how you can deal this issue? So this is need to be addressed. This is need to be talked about. In the UNIA process, we raised this issue as well. And we talk about the global plastic treaty should address this issue. If uh, the plastic is uh, allowed to recycle, that should not be release or leakage of microplastic. Thank you. Krasnia? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that textiles are um, a huge source of microfibers in the environment. I think the principal source of microfibers in the environment, actually. And I think something like 60 to 70 percent of all clothing contains plastics of one form or another. Um, and as that's washed, as it's worn, as it's disposed, that all releases microfibers into the environment. And, you know, that's one of those difficult decisions, difficult choices, isn't it, for us as consumers, because we can buy clothes more cheaply if they contain plastics, um, but we don't want to buy clothes con that contain plastics because they're ultimately going to pollute the environment. So I guess something like, you know, a plastic tax would it'll just make all clothes more expensive. It won't make the non-plastic ones cheaper, but, you know, <laughs> at least it might you know, have, have some kind of impact in terms of what people buy. Yeah, and I think ultimately we will need the industry to design better products with the lower environmental impact because the challenge we have is of design. You know, petrochemical companies designing pl plastic products that are single use, that uh, cannot enter into circular economy and that are ending up in the environment. I think ultimately we need to address the issue of design. And uh, Louis, you may answer. You may add something for that. Yeah, I think I think design is certainly part of it, but I, I think also some of these concepts, um, like microplastics, are are fundamentally um, fairly abstract. So I think for the wider public also to be aware of these. I mean, this is also um, a good space for the arts and activism to, in part, perhaps publicly shame corporations, um, bad practices, um, but also just for awareness, but a kind of quite an urgent awareness um, across the spectrum of local to political structures to, you know, uh, people who are actually can affect change, um, change policy and so forth. And yes, definitely the arts has a place um, in motivating that change, but um, it certainly, it, it's just such an enormous problem and it's an invisible problem. Um, so it needs to become sort of visible ultimately and um, a variety of media and activism and the arts, um, but people really need to be speaking up about it because it's it's literally a sort of invisible killer really. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. When you talk about art, uh, there's a question but from, uh from Kelvin, and it is directed to Nelmo, and he's asking, how do you measure the impact you are creating in your music? This is we would want to hear from Nelmo. Yeah, um, basically, uh, sometimes it's very hard to measure, but uh, I think it's also looking at the, 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 the role that music and art plays in the whole conversations, because music is there to mobilize, to influence and to spark conversations on some of these issues. So basically what we do is that uh, we use art to be able to spark conversations and be able to put people in the um, whole conversation. Sometimes so many people, it's very hard to be able to consume academic uh, kind of conversation. But when we package them into music and uh, uh, visual art and film, then it's very easy for people to understand and get the concept of whatever we're talking about. and take it even down there to the local level. Maybe I can just give an, uh, uh, an example with whatever Kevin Odong was asking about how do you get the policies uh, that um, would be talked about in the COP26 and uh, those high level meetings into uh, even the, uh, the people at the community level to get to understand. Uh, I think that's where art comes uh, in then because 
it's very easy to mobilize through art. It's very easy to pass information through art. So I think basically that's how you can be able to answer. And um, uh, on how to measure, I don't think I've ever measured uh, <laughs> my, the impact that music makes directly to the people, but uh, it sparks conversations and it's able to make sure that we get the music to the uh, lowest part of our communities. I think we have a big following from Kenya and he's uh, raising a lot of questions and this is very nice coming from where I come from. And there is a question from Teresia Warui and she's asking how can we hold corporates to who produce plastics responsible? Who, uh, who is going to answer that? I may start. So, um, okay. so. Yes, precisely. This is one of our key demands at COP26 and in general in our work uh, with the Alliance of Breakthrough from Plastic. Um, next week, we're just going to launch the fourth brand audit report in which um, a, a large number of communities around the world have been auditing the brands of the plastic pollution that they found. And um, for the past editions, what we've seen is that it's always the same companies, the same consumer got goods companies that are responsible for this plastic pollution. So being able to do this exercise of identifying the oranges, the source of these plastic pollutions and directly identifying who are the brands responsible for this is a really important step. These are the companies that most of the time are also um, bringing forward really nice, well-designed policies saying that they are caring about plastic pollution, that they are doing lots for recycling, that they are cleaning the beaches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what we're seeing is that actually their plastic production, their pl the use of plastic is increasing. So this really discredits these companies. This really shows that actually there's no real action in reducing plastic pollution, which we know like as much as we recycle, as much as we do lots of things with the plastic when it's wasted, we need to reduce the plastic in the first place from the production to the consumption. There is no way that we're going to stop plastic um, pollution if we don't reduce the plastic production. So for example, in COP26, Unilever is one of the principal partners sponsoring the COP26. These companies are placing themselves in strategic positions to show, to pretend that they care about plastic pollution. And we need to be very careful in identifying those greenwashing strategies and, 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 and calling them for what they really are, which are plastic polluters of our environment. Thank you. And people have had issues with the Unilever being part of the COP26 and they feel like polluters should be on the table. But it's good that everybody should be at the table so that uh, we discuss and bring solutions as a globe, uh, everybody being involved. And uh, there is a question from uh, Shiba Ahmed Khan, and she's asking, the University of Portsmouth is doing some great uh, work globally. How can we work more with the local communities here to get this message across and understood by all sections of the community? And I think that would be going to Cressida or, or Louis. Hi, Shiva. Yeah, we're, we're really, really keen to um, use these methodologies in Portsmouth as well as in um, cities in the Global South. I mean, I'm, I'd actually be really keen to, you know, trial some creative methods with um, industry and government and policymakers and see where we get with that. But certainly in Portsmouth, we're just starting a project um, on um, the, our relationship with the marine environment and marine resources. And we'll, we will be working with, I think, especially with the Bangladeshi community in Portsmouth um, to use creative methods to explore and um, facilitate our relationship with ocean and protecting ocean resource. So look out for that. I think we're going to be in touch with you quite soon. Louis? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's, it, it is definitely great to do it locally. I do think actually it's, it's in some ways it's very easy to work in Nairobi and maybe Kenya at large, because I think there's, um, 
there's a certain kind of respect for the arts and the arts isn't disconnected from the community that all that output it sort of goes in, in, in a kind of really nice circular way where i think in the uk and maybe in the west possibly it art has been kind of um sort of separated from everyday life so i think the goal as well is to maybe reconnect um making art thinking about art talking about art as something which is much more of a kind of public open form but um i think cresta would agree in kenya it feels very natural <laughs> to kind of have art embedded in the community and for it to be um open to all um to participate and that's actually been really great and if we could um encourage that and bring that um in our local communities i think that would be an amazing contribution uh saida uh, do you have any other questions unanswered so um we have we do have a few more questions. I'm not sure that we've got time to um, go through them all. Um, thank you for everyone um, for um, entering those questions. Um, I'll just take uh, uh, one more um, from Theresia. Um, how can uh, we hold um, corporates who are um, producing plastics uh, responsible? I think that was asked, uh, unless somebody else wants to add anything more. Maria. Okay. Um, Maria, I've, you can add. Yeah, Maria can add something. So we're talking about the corporates who produce the plastic, the petrochemical companies. Um, so we can do a lot of things, but one of the things that we are doing in the context of COP26 is to connect with the frontline communities that are being the first impacted by the pollution resulting from producing plastic. And there's um, lots of environmental justice communities that are just there, just living next to the petrochemical companies. Um, this, you know, in the US, all over Africa, we know of um, human rights violations all over the place. And we are working with them, organizing, and they're coming to COP26 to bring their testimonies, to speak up and to show how the production of plastic is impacting their lives from the extraction of the oil to the very much disposal and throughout all the life cycle of plastic, how much this is impacting communities all over the world. So I think there's a real value in connecting with the people directly impacted and bringing them up to the table and bringing them to the negotiation table so that we really May give give a give a face and give a life to those stories, and we don't talk about pollution as that is abstract context. We realize that actually this is impacting people's lives, children's future, the elderly, our families, our environment. So, so I think yeah, bringing the grassroots group, connecting with them, and making sure that they are part of the decision making process is a really important way to to hold these corporations accountable. Thank you very much for that. I think we had ha we have had a very good uh, discussion, and uh, it's time to go now. And uh, thank you so much. It was great questions and answers. This is an important discussion, and we hope that this will raise awareness of the clear link between plastics and climate change. The plastic crisis is a climate. The plastic crisis is a climate crisis. Steve and Cressida will be heading to Glasgow for the COP26 with this message and the demand for actions, not just words. I think we have had people talking for the longest time. It's time for action. I'm sure, I, I'm sure they will take the messages for this webinar conversations with them. I believe the contact information for speakers are in the chat box for those who would like to get in touch. I would like to close by thanking all our speakers, the panel and the audience for joining us today. Goodbye and thank you so much.